Today's gospel lesson is a case study in mistaken identity. Not once, but twice, Jesus acts and those around him fail to understand what he's doing and why he's doing it. And because they misunderstand what Jesus is doing, they misunderstand who he is. The first time he acts is before a crowd of people who've been following him around, and the second time he acts is before his closest disciples. And both of those times, those who see him act miss the point of what he's doing. And because they miss the point, they misunderstand how what it is Jesus is doing applies to them. And we need to pay very close attention to the way that this plays out because as it happens, Jesus is still acting, still speaking to us today just as he spoke to the crowds and as he spoke to his disciples. So our question today is, are we ready to hear what he has to say? Or will we too fail to understand? Now, before we get to that, I want to make sure we're all aware of a rather interesting thing that's happened since last week. We've made an important shift And this shift bears on how we understand what we hear Jesus saying in today's gospel. You may have noticed that we've made a change. For the last several weeks, almost two months now, all of our gospel lessons have been drawn from the gospel according to Mark. We've seen Jesus heal people from disease. We've seen him attract large crowds with his preaching. We've seen him send out his disciples to preach the good news. And today, suddenly, somewhat unexpectedly, we're no longer in Mark. Today, we're dropped right into the middle of John. And we're going to be here for a little while. For the next month, our gospel lessons are all going to come from just one chapter of John's gospel. And then at the end of that month, we're going back to Mark. And we're going to pick up right where we left off. So let me suggest a little homework. When you go home today, look up chapter 6 of Mark's gospel and read it. Then look up chapter 6 of John's gospel and read it. And you will find that there are some very obvious similarities. But there are also some very interesting differences. Some of which are quite subtle, but are nonetheless quite important. And then every week for the next month, for the next four weeks, before you come to worship on Sunday morning, read all of chapter six of John's gospel. That's it. One chapter of the Bible for the next month. That's all you have to do. (laughs) If you do that, you will find that you will be able to make better sense of the gospel lessons that we'll hear in the coming weeks. There is a lot going on in chapter six of John, and it is very easy to lose sight of the forest for all of the trees. But if you can keep in mind a sense of everything that happens in that chapter, it will give you a better understanding of the individual gospel lessons you'll hear over the next several weeks. And if at some point you decide you'd like to talk about the similarities and the differences between chapter six of Mark and chapter six of John, you know where to find me. Happy to do that. For now, back to today's gospel lesson and the examples that we see here of mistaken identity. The first time we see people mistaking who Jesus is happens immediately after he feeds the crowd. Jesus somehow manages to turn five barley loaves and a few pieces of salted fish into a meal large enough to feed a small army. And the people are stunned. John says, when the people saw the sign that Jesus had done, they began to say, this is indeed the prophet who has come into the world. And so they decide they are going to stage a revolution right there, and they're going to make Jesus king. They misunderstand who Jesus is because they misunderstand what it is that he's done and what it means for them. And the second time that we see people mistake who Jesus is happens after the disciples set out across the Sea of Galilee. They're out there in their boat. They're pulling away at the oars. They're battling a rising storm. And suddenly they see Jesus coming toward them through the wind and the waves. And they are terrified because how does he do that? 
I mean, what kind of a being can walk on water? Ghosts and monsters and sorcerers, maybe, but not normal people. They misunderstand who Jesus is. And because they misunderstand who he is, they fail to see what Jesus means for them. Now, the crowds and the disciples are not the only people who have failed to recognize Jesus as he is portrayed in these stories. Over the years, some people have gone to rather creative lengths to try and explain these stories, or rather try and explain away these stories. How could Jesus have possibly multiplied five loaves and two fish into enough food to feed an army? Doesn't seem plausible. How could Jesus possibly have walked on water? Doesn't seem plausible. So let's find some other way of reading these stories. Maybe Jesus didn't really multiply loaves and fishes. Maybe what really happened is that Jesus and his disciples shared the food they had, and their inspiring example encouraged others to do the same. So everyone opens up their picnic baskets, they all share with one another, and it's the first church potluck. And then over time, the story gets blown out of proportion. That sounds reasonable. And maybe Jesus didn't really walk on water. Maybe what really happened is that he was walking on the shore next to the water. And the disciples, because they were in the middle of a storm, didn't realize how close they were to the land. But when Jesus called out to them, they suddenly oriented themselves to where they really were. And it was as if they had suddenly reached a destination that they had thought was a lot further away. Over time, the story gets blown out of proportion. That sounds reasonable. Both of those stories, again, represent a case of mistaken identity. If we read these stories in a way that tries to minimize what the stories are actually trying to say, then we end up missing who Jesus really is. And when we mistake who Jesus really is, we will misunderstand what he means for us. So what is it that these stories have to tell us? What is the point of the story of the feeding of the 5,000? And what is the point of the story of Jesus walking on water? As is the case in just about every story about Jesus in the Gospels, these stories are about a lot more than just Jesus. They're about Jesus, yes. But what they say about Jesus has consequences not only for how we think about him, but for how we think about pretty much everything else. Take the story of the feeding of the 5,000. There is a lot more going on here than just Jesus showing off. The image of God's people gathered in the wilderness and eating a meal that is miraculously provided would have immediately evoked any number of associations and images in the minds of those who had seen Jesus do that. You remember the story of Israel receiving the gift of manna in the wilderness? Now, through Jesus, God is once again providing bread for his people. Remember the story of the time that God provided food for his people when there was a famine in Gilgal? They're down to only 20 loaves of barley. The prophet Elijah tells the people, go ahead and eat. God will provide. Lo and behold, they have enough. And there's even some left over. And now God continues to be faithful to the covenant promise that he has made to Israel. And he renews that promise. He renews that covenant through his anointed one. What about the story of Jesus walking on the water? Here again, the story would have immediately brought to mind any number of episodes in the history of Israel's relationship with God. When the waters saw you, O God, when the waters saw you, they were afraid. The very deep trembled, the clouds poured out water, and the sky thundered. Your way was through the sea, and your path was through the mighty waters, and your footsteps were unseen. That's Psalm 77. And that's the kind of image that the people of Jesus' day would have had in the back of their minds when they heard this story about Jesus. 
So yes, these stories tell us something important about Jesus, but they tell us something else as well. They tell us that God is faithful to his covenant promise. They tell us that the power of God is greater than any power in this world. They tell us that in Jesus, God's intentions for his people, for his people and for the world are being realized. And they tell us something else. They tell us that it can be easy to misunderstand who Jesus is. And now we get to the question, what might these stories have to say to us? And the first thing we want to do here is be careful to avoid the mistakes that the crowds and the disciples both made. The crowds wanted to make him a king and the disciples were afraid of him. We need to avoid both responses. The crowds wanted to make Jesus a king because of what they thought he could do for them. They weren't really interested in what he had in mind. They were interested in what they had in mind. You will see this in chapter 6 of John's Gospel. And that's a temptation that is just as easy for us to fall into as it was for the crowds. So we need to ask ourselves, is our faith in Jesus something that we exercise only because we believe it is ultimately in our own self-interest? Or is our faith in Jesus a way of perhaps hedging our bets a little? If that's the case, then we're not really talking about faith. We're talking about something else. We have tried to turn Jesus into a king who will do something for us. Real faith, on the other hand, involves giving ourselves to Jesus in a way that allows God to set the agenda and not us. Real faith involves following Jesus in the way that he leads and not in the way that we would like him to lead. Real faith is not a contract between us and God. Real faith is about complete surrender and radical obedience. And that makes real faith frightening because it makes us vulnerable. When we open ourselves that much to anyone, let alone to God, we worry about what's going to happen. And that's the moment at which we're tempted to fall into the response that the disciples have. We're tempted to fall back into fear. And that fear can prevent us from letting God get too close. This is where we need to hear what Jesus says to his disciples. It is I. Do not be afraid. I am the one who made you. Do not be afraid. I am the one in whom you live and move and have your being. Do not be afraid. I am the one who loves you and has called you friend. Do not be be afraid. The words that Jesus speaks in today's gospel are the same words he speaks to all those who seek to follow him. And we need to hear the voice of Jesus as he speaks to us, not just as he spoke 2,000 years ago to somebody else, but as he speaks to us today. Because we're here today, not just because of what we believe Jesus did in the past, we're here today because we believe Jesus is alive today and is speaking to us. When we listen for his voice, then the presence of Jesus becomes a living reality for us and not just a remembrance of something that happened a long time ago in a faraway land. And listening for the voice of Jesus is not easy. We each have any number of needs that we would like Jesus to address. We would like to make Jesus our king. There are any number of storms going on around us all the time, and it's very easy to be distracted by the noise and the tumult and the darkness and to succumb to fear. But if we stop and focus, if we stop and listen, then the voice we will hear is that one. It is I, the one who made you, the one who sustains you. Do not be afraid.
Jesus comes to us as the only one who can tell us not only who he is, but who God is and who we are. When Jesus says, this is who I am, he's also saying, this is who God is. And he's also saying, this is who you are. Jesus comes to us as the one who can give us the gift of himself. And in giving us himself, he gives us everything else as well, even the gift of ourselves. Apart from Jesus, we have none of those things, not even the gift of ourselves. But when we walk with him, we have all of those things. Sometimes, many times, we wish Jesus would be the king that we want him to be. Sometimes we're afraid of him, afraid of what he might ask of us. To both of those things, Jesus says the same thing to us. It is I. Do not be afraid. We may find, as the disciples did, that if we're willing to hear him and take him into our lives, we may reach the destination that we've been straining for a lot easier and a lot sooner than we expected.